Um, okay, uh, let's let's get started. Let's get started. This is the fun bit. This is the fun bit. All right. Uh, two years ago, I did songs for each uh, person. Last year, we did haikus. This year, it's interpretive dance. <laughs> so the first uh, the first topic is. I'm kidding, I'm not doing that this year, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Calm down, sir, I'm not gonna do it, I promise. Maybe later we can talk and we'll figure it out, but... No, this year it's limericks, this year it's limericks. So uh, the first talk is, can rationality be taught? Uh, Daniel Dennett, Julia Galef, uh, Barbara Drescher, Scott Lillian Field, and Ginger Campbell. And here we go, ready? Uh, Dan, Ginger, Julia, Barbara, and Scott are about to tell you what they've got. The topic you see is rationality. And if the damn stupid thing can be taught, Please welcome to the stage Daniel Dow Dennett, Julia Galef, Barbara Drescher, Scott Lillianfield, and moderator Ginger Campbell. to see if I can see everybody. Of course I can't. Well, I'm really happy to be able to do a panel at the very beginning when everyone's fresh. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be exploring a pretty interesting idea. Can rationality be taught? To start out with, I'm going to ask my panelists to briefly answer, do they think yes or no? And if so, why, just really briefly, just to jump things off. And I think that since Daniel Dennett is probably an inspiration to all of us, we're going to let him go first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ginger. Um, as a philosopher, you would think I'd say, yes, rationality can be taught. But then I look at my philosophical opponents, and these are professionals. and. They say the most irrational things, and they can be remarkably uh, impervious to arguments, so much so that um, uh, I often say, and my colleagues say as well, um, I I'm not trying to convince them of errors in their ways. I'm just trying to convince their students of, of their ways. In fact, if, for instance, if, uh, if John Searle started agreeing with me at this point, I'd be worried about his health. And I'll save till the next, to the next time I speak uh, of some interesting research that I think that bears on that. So roughly I would say uh, to some small extent rationality can be taught, but much less than you'd think. And uh, professional philosophers are a pretty good example of the limits of rationality. <laughs> Do you want to pick the next most inspiring person, Ginger? <laughs> uh, I, I set myself up for that, didn't I? Well, it must be Julia. <laughs> well, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, so the, the organization that I co-founded is called the Center for Applied Rationality. Um, and we, are, we were founded on the premise that rationality can be taught to at least some extent to at least the crowd of people who want to come to a workshop and learn rationality, <laughs> uh, which might sound like a trivial claim, but it, it actually isn't. Um, I think that, that wanting, being interested in rationality and wanting to be better at rationality uh, is a um, maybe not necessary, but certainly very helpful precondition, but it, it doesn't actually get you that far in terms of, of being rational in your sort of day-to-day -day decisions and judgments. Um, so that alone is, you know, uh, a claim that I'm pretty confident in and one that I, I think um, would make a big difference you know, if we're right about that. Um, I think that we don't actually have a lot of direct, strong evidence yet um, in the academic literature about uh, how exactly rationality can be taught. Um, nevertheless, I am optimistic because of a whole bunch of other pretty compelling indirect evidence, um, which maybe I'll save for later in the discussion. Barb? Um, I'm not as optimistic as Julia is. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I, I like the way that Dan put it, th that there are limits to it. So my, my short answer was yes and no. And I, mm -hmm. I, 
I'm not an optimist at heart, so I, I lean on the no a lot. But of course, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't think that we could um, teach it to some degree. And to go into any detail, I would, I would have to go on and on about that. But I think there, there are things about, we have to break down rationality into what makes it different than things like critical thinking and intelligence and, and tease it apart, which we have, there's lots of literature on, so we can talk about that. And then talk about the parts of that that, we, that can be taught and the parts that um, I, I still try to teach, but I don't know if I have a lot of hope for. Last but not least, Scott. <laughs> So um, I'm a psychologist by training, and I actually teach a, a course on critical thinking. At least I, I did until a couple years ago. And I, I sort of like Barbara, I wouldn't be in this business unless I thought it could be taught to some degree. But, and I do think it can be taught to some degree. But I think the educational psychology literature gives us a little bit of reason for, for pause. And I think, <laughs> if I recall correctly, Dan may correct me, I think the first three words in his uh, Intuition Pumps book are, thinking is hard. And, it, it is really hard, it does not come naturally, and I think, and I can say more about this, but I think if there's one finding, at least in my reading of the educational psychology literature that's consistent, it's that critical thinking can be taught to a degree, but it's very domain specific is the problem. It's, first of all, it's very hard to teach in abstract. I think one mistake I made when I first started teaching critical thinking is just sort of teaching it in very abstract principles without giving people an actual sense of what the subject matter has to be applied to. I think that's one issue. but. The literature, I think, suggests that in general, it does work to a degree, but then it often doesn't generalize to other disciplines. And I think that's always the, the key problem, and I think we can all talk about it. Dan gave a couple of examples, but we can probably regale ourselves with tales of all the Nobel Prize winners who are obviously brilliant in one domain, who have remarkably irrational ideas mm -hmm. in others, which I think suggests this kind of domain specificity. So the question is, which maybe we can address, is at what level should critical thinking uh, and rationality be taught? I think that's not something we have a good handle on just yet. Okay, so let's back up for one step to the question of, well, is rationality something that you're born with or a skill that you have to learn? And is it something different from critical thinking? It, it's very different from critical thinking, actually. I mean, it's, it, critical thinking is a component in rationality. But I think that we, I, I think that all of us, even those of us who study it, quite often tend to think of rationality as being intelligence. and. It's baffling why really, really smart people do some incredibly stupid things. And it's, it's very different from, um, they are different things. There's a different skill set and there's a, there are different fa um, um, factors that go into how well somebody can rational, or how, how, rational, how rational people are and how consistent they are with mm -hmm. rationality than there is with intelligence. Intelligence is, is basically cognitive abilities and rationality includes this huge component about what you will do, not necessarily what you can do, but what you will do in given situations. So you may be able to be rational all the time, but none of us are. So clearly there's a component, there are components that are dispositional. So if they're dispositional, then we have to, to figure out where do our dispositions come from? And there has to be some mix of genetics and environment and development there that Needs, still needs to be teased out, I think. Do any of you have a working definition for rationality? Not critical thinking, rationality. What's your working mm. definition, anyone? No, Long. I don't think. <laughs> I, I do, but oh, I, I no. wanted to give somebody else no. a chance to talk. I mean, without getting too technical, um, the word, so there, there's descriptive rationality, which is the study of how people actually reason. Then there's normative rationality, which is like perfect reasoning. Um, so, you know, like making all of your, updating, updating your beliefs in response to new evidence in perfect accordance with probability theory, um, reasoning perfectly logically without contradictions, uh, like internal inconsistencies. Um, and, and, and if we're going to expand the definition of rationality to a sort of instrumental definition that they use, say, in behavioral economics, then that would also include sort of maximizing your expected utility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is like not, it, this is so far off from what the human brain is designed to do that uh, I don't know of anyone seriously arguing that this is something that like we could realistically strive for. Um, and then third, there's what's called prescriptive rationality, um, which is uh, a sort of uh, like guidelines for how to start with what the brain we've got and, and do things that, that 
may not look like you know, trying to optimize our expected utility or trying to do probability calculations, but that, that result in us having judgments um, and decisions that are, you know, in practice actually a little closer to the ideal. Um, so that would include sort of various debiasing techniques yeah. and, and changes to your, to your disposition to make you more inclined to use those techniques. Dan, so it seems like the, the ideal of being rational came to us from philosophy. Yeah. So what are philosophers talking about when they talk about rationality? Well, pretty much what Julia said, but I want, I want to pick up on something that Julia said um, and say that I, I used to worry, it used to bother me, it used to depress me that uh, philosophers and scientists um, are so good at defending their own position, at, at, at arguing against other people, and so hard, bad at seeing the flaws in their own arguments. And then a couple of years ago, 20, in 2011, Pascal Mercier and Dan Sperber published a wonderful article in Behavioral and Brain Sciences called something like, Why Do We Reason? And they argue very convincingly that our cognitive systems are designed to be partisan, that, there, that there's a sort of an opportunistic partisanism built right into our capacity to reason, which means that we, uh, we tend to favor positions that we can find good arguments for, not necessarily the best positions, but we, we like to be able to support with arguments the positions that we, that we publicly avow. And, um, and we're much better at persuading others than we are at, being pers uh, at seeing the difficulties in our own arguments. Um, they argue, I think, very convincingly that we really have to think of, of, of reasoning um, you know, the way we think of romance. It takes two to tango. You, there has to be a communication, or at its best, there's, um, there's a debate of sorts, not like a high school debate, which is sort of stagey, but a, an interaction between people with opposing views uh, that, that we're sort of biased. It's like a, the gain is set in our, in our critical thinking to expect to be up against a, a, a wall of disbelief and to be very good at persuading, um, not so good at finding the flaws in our own arguments. Uh, I highly recommend that article. It's in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. And the great thing about an article in Behavioral and Brain Sciences is that it illustrates this very point and always has. Every issue has a target article or several target articles together with reactions, comments right there in the same issue from usually several dozen people in the field. And in a field like cognitive science where you're, it's very interdisciplinary, almost everything you read in it, you, you, it's not quite your field and you want to know what the people in the field make of this. And you get an instant read on what they take seriously and what, they're more, uh, what they tend to disagree with. So I think uh, group discussion is not just uh, pleasant, it's actually an important element in correcting the flaws in our own reasoning. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, just to follow up on what Dan said, I, I agree, and I like that article too, by the way, I think it's, it's quite, quite provocative. I think in some ways it goes back to your initial question, which is are we born with it, does it have to be taught, and that, that's, a, that's one of the few ones we can give a clear cut answer to. The answer is I think it's clear, it's, it's not something that comes naturally to the human species, and I think that's one of the key things I've learned, one of the main things I try to inculcate in my students is that scientific thinking, which I, I, I believe, at least in principle, at its best can lead to rationality, is, is not something that's <coughs> natural. So take confirmation bias. I think this, their article is in many respects an article about how confirmation bias evolves. And in, in essence, my reading of their article is a confirmation bias really this tendency that we all have. I'm prone to mm -hmm. it, you're prone to it, we're all prone to, to seek out evidence consistent with what we believe, deny, dismiss, distort evidence that is inconsistent with what we believe. But that's something that really is a fairly natural byproduct, I think, of the way the brain is, is structured. 
and I, I see science in many ways as a set of safeguards against confirmation Good. bias. But yeah. as Dan points out, scientists themselves, and the late Mike Mahoney, a psychologist, showed this, scientists themselves, and I suspect all of us, including me, um, are no more immune to confirmation bias than the <laughs> average person. His research shows that. But the scientific community is really the best safeguard against confirmation bias. Scientists themselves, good scientists should try to compensate for their own propensities toward confirmation bias, but they're not very good at it. <laughs> so it's up to the scientific community in the kind of grand argument that Dan talks about to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that their confirmation bias does not get in the way of their corroborating their own hypotheses. I wanted to um, just speak to that one question that you had about a, a definition of rationality because it, it feels like we're, we haven't really pinned it down. And I think I have a simpler, I work with a simpler definition of it. Um, we can break it down into those pieces that Julie was talking about and instrumental and you know, so forth. But in a nutshell, at least to a, a lay audience, I usually say that it is, it's the reasoning process um, and a set of beliefs that you currently hold that are consistent with meeting your goals, with maximizing benefits and meeting the goals that you actually have. Um, and I, I qualify it with actually have because quite often we get to where we, we are and then we decide what our goals were <laughs> um, based on the yeah. answer that we came. And that's irrationality. But rationality would be a process that leads to the goals that you actually have. Um, with you know happiness or or benefiting humanity, you know saving as many mm -hmm. lives as possible, all of those things. Is that yeah? Well, we can all agree on yeah. With that as a simple, it gets simple confusing term. because uh, I think that's a great definition of, of instrumental rationality. Yeah, um, but and then people you have to add in the we also have beliefs that are consistent with the knowledge we currently have. Yeah, and it, so you have to qualify it with that. Yeah, it it does. I think. I think that one thing that gets lost when, when we talk about how humans aren't naturally good at um, you know, doubting their own judgments um, or like looking for al alternative points of view and, and taking them seriously, which is true, and I agree completely with that, but one thing that gets lost is that there's a significant amount of variation between people in how good or, or bad they actually are. Um, and uh, a researcher named Keith Stanovich, uh, who I assume you guys all know, um, uh, who's on our advisory board, uh, has done like some of the best work out there on sort of charting what the deviations are or what the spread of, of skill at these various um, aspects of rationality is um, and trying to pick apart what makes the difference. Um, and maybe I can tie together these two things that we've been talking about uh, into one by saying that Stanovich likes to break down the sort of uh, practical skills that go into being rational into two main categories, one of which is being able to, to think uh, in terms of manipulating symbols, which is what you're doing when you're reasoning logically or, um, or probabilistically. Um, and this actually is uh, pretty correlated with IQ. So uh, in that sense, it's like kind of innate. Um, and so people who are strong in this, on this dimension are good at avoiding the kinds of biases and fallacies that involve probability and logic, like the gambler's fallacy where, you know, this coin came up head three times, so I'm due for a tails, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other category of rational skills, uh, rationality skills, is you could call it reflectiveness or open-mindedness. Um, it's more of a disposition than a skill. And it's, it's just the tendency to stop and ask yourself, is that right? Might there be another explanation for what I'm seeing? Um, and also the tendency to be actually open to changing your mind um, in response to new evidence. And, uh, and interestingly, that, that one's not correlated with IQ. <laughs> I, I was really interested in that. Um, so, so both of those dimensions, the abstract symbol manipulation and the um, openness to changing one's mind, uh, are, uh, show a lot of difference between individuals. And uh, uh, I think that is not sufficient evidence to, to show that uh, we can definitely train it. Um, but I think that it's more promising than it would be if everyone were uniformly bad at it. Yep. And he's, he's trying, by the way, too, as you probably know, he's mm -hmm. been working, as I understand, the last couple of years to develop a, a battery of tests to measure RQ, rationality quotient. Right. 
And it is surprising, most of the elements are surprisingly independent of IQ. And interestingly, even when you statistically control out for IQ using some statistical procedures, there's still a glue that ties a lot of these tasks together, which I guess does suggest that there is at least some domain generality that across all of these different <coughs> rationality tasks, there's at least a, a weak to moderate positive correlation, which mm -hmm. I agree, it really doesn't show we can train it, but does suggest that maybe if you train it in one domain, it could generalize to others, at least it leaves open that possibility. But based on all these definitions that you've given us, and especially Barb's, it sounds to me like a person could make a decision that is rational based on what they know and believe yes. that another person might not think was rational. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because sure. they have Absolutely. a different knowledge. Set. Because they have a different right. worldview yeah. or a different, different, set, yeah. different information. Then, they're, then it, they're, yeah. it's perfectly rational to start with two different sets of information or two sets of presumptions and come to a completely different conclusion and both of them be rational. But, but part of the problem is that we also wrap into rationality what you're start coming in with. So if you're, you're coming in with a set of beliefs that's not necessarily consistent with, with knowledge, that's, that's a premise, right? So it's, there's so many aspects to this. You can, you can provide all of the knowledge um, and you can provide all of the skills, but put it, putting that together is, is a big problem. One of the, when we're talking about teaching people the skills and um, part of the problem with teaching people skills and the domain specificity of that is you can teach, there's a whole set of, of cognitive tasks that people are very good at when they're abstract and as soon as you add context to it, it falls apart. There are other tasks where the opposite is true, but uh, a good example, I used to teach intermediate statistics um, and mm -hmm. I always taught probability theory because they think it's the foundation and they really need to understand it. And I could train students to do really well on calculating the probabilities of getting a specific color marble, pulling it out of a bag, and they could do you know joint probability and all of this. And the second I changed marbles, to M&Ms, the whole thing fell apart. <laughs> and it's because human beings work with schemas. Schemas are blueprints for how the world works. And you can give people a domain-specific set of schemas and they will make good decisions and rational decisions, but they won't necessarily be able to generalize that or transfer that to a novel situation that has a different context. And that's where we run into trouble, but I think that if you do enough of this, I think that if you practice this enough in enough different domains, I think that it starts to become more automatic when, they, when they're no longer having to think step by step, what bias am I, am I gonna be, you know, have a problem with and I've gotta avoid, and when they no longer have to think that and it becomes a little more natural, that's when I think it starts to transfer. So I think there's some hope. Is that the ability to, to transfer across domains, is that dependent on intelligence? I don't know. I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Yeah. I would guess <laughs> that that's all it is. Yeah. That it has more to do with experience and mm -hmm. practice. Um, as a number of us have pointed out that our, our native thinking powers have been enhanced and corrected and refined with a lot of invented tools, statistics, logic, all sorts of, of thinking tools. And as, as uh, Barb was just saying, uh, if you have to talk to yourself about how to use the tool, you, you're, not, you're not really adept yet. You have to become a skilled user of the tool mm -hmm. and of all of the tools. And then, and this is I think a, a, a point that Scott was getting at, you, you have to be a, a sort of self-conscious about your own weaknesses when you use the tools. Um, and and that's, really, that's really hard. I, I, wanna, I wanna tell a little, a, a little confession. Um, I think in fact that people mainly, academic scientists, um, the, their heart plays a bigger role, their emotions play a bigger role than we usually acknowledge. Um, I've been arguing, I, I mentioned John Searle before, he'll be my example. I've been arguing against John Searle's godforsaken Chinese room argument for, what, 30 years. And I think it's pretty demonstrably a fallacy in its various forms, 
but you'll never convince John of that. Um, nor are we convinced many people. The Chinese room argument is a very in, uh, attractive argument. And I learned, I would try to explain to people why it was wrong. This is the argument that artificial intelligence is impossible. Uh, strong AI, as he calls it. And I would say, look, I'm going to point out the fallacies in this argument. And their eyes glaze over, and it's very clear they don't want to hear about the fallacies. They like his conclusion so much. And they like the fact that a famous Berkeley professor says that strong AI is impossible. They don't want to hear my, my details. And I, I used to have contempt, quite frankly, for that attitude. And then I caught myself doing the same thing. I confess to having a deep, visceral dislike of the Bohr interpretation of quantum mechanics. <laughs> but I'm no expert. <laughs> and then I read my friend Murray Gell-Mann's book, The Quark and the Jaguar. And he laces into the Bohr interpretation. He has a chapter called Quantum Flapdoodle. And he just beats them up with a stick. And I just loved it. And I'm reading this and say, sick him, Murray. Go, go. This is fantastic. And all of a sudden, I realize, look, I'm impressed that this Nobel Prize winner, famous Murray Gell man, agrees with me. <laughs> am, I able to, am I able to assess his arguments reasonably? No. I'm just happy to have him on my team. You know? and, and once I recognized that, first of all, I became much more understanding of what the problem is that I face. People get invested in their views, particularly scientists and philosophers get invested in their views. And you actually wouldn't want it any other way. Um, you want that cutting edge of inquiry to be peopled by partisans who are giving their all to show that they're right. And there's a lot of ego in that, but it's that clash of egos that's actually playing an important role. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think we've now touched on what I think are the, the two keys to actually teaching rationality. Um, this is somewhat speculative because you know, we don't have decades of academic research on this, but um, to me, the, the failure of academia to have found ways to reliably teach rationality that work and that, you know, uh, that people will sort of seamlessly uh, generalize across domains, that failure is not actually that discouraging to me. Um, and that's because I think that the, the two important pieces that you need to have in order uh, to have a, a, a method of teaching rationality that actually works are first, you need people to be able to recognize in, in the field, so to speak, that, oh, this is like an instance where I you know, might be committing the you know, whatever bias, or like, oh, this is an instance where it would be valuable to do a thought experiment or something like that. So they need to recognize that, that this is the you know, situation to um, you know, be wary or to use this tool or whatever. Um, and that is absolutely hampered by domain, uh, the problem of domain transfer. It's also hampered just by the, the difficulty of establishing habits. Um, you know, you can like, even if you practice something on a bunch of domains in a class, if you leave that class and are never reminded of it again, then, you know, chances are you're not going to mm -hmm. use it again. Um, and, and then the second problem, uh, which Dan brought up, is the problem of wanting to correct for the bias and wanting to use the technique. Um, and so I don't think that the, the there ha hasn't actually been that much effort to try debiasing interventions um, in the literature. And, and there have been critical thinking classes uh, and you know, skeptic magazines and so on, of course. Um, but I don't think that any of those efforts so far have really made much of an attempt to try to address those two key points uh, of of getting people to notice when to try to be rational um, and getting people to want to do that. Uh, so those are, those are the two points that, that CIFAR, that my organization is, is really trying to focus on um, in various ways. And just to give you like a very quick picture of what we're doing, um, at the workshops that we run, we spend about two thirds of the time uh, just talking about real life case studies in people's lives of decisions they're trying to make or uh, problems they're having. Um, and listening to other people's case studies as well, and then talking about 
you know, how to address those with the techniques rather than just talking about, you know, how to reason probabilistically or how to use reference classes. Um, and then we also uh, try to give people triggers such that when they're out, you know, in their day-to-day -day life and they notice this trigger, that's their sort of automatic cue to, you know, think, oh, maybe I'm rationalizing, for example. So you can, you can like, learn to notice, oh, I have, like, defensive body posture in this argument <laughs> that I'm having. Um, that's my cue to, like, relax my body posture and, and like, try to be more open-minded or do some little, like, me meditation or mindfulness exercise or whatever has been shown to work for me. Um, and then in terms of wanting to use the techniques, I think to some extent people can be convinced that, you know, considering that they might be wrong is actually good for them. Like there's this little, little meditation that I, that I do sometimes, actually quite a lot, where I imagine the world in which I am wrong but I don't know it and what the consequence of that would be. Um, so for example, when we were just starting CIFAR, I was excitedly telling a friend of mine about it and he, he was pretty pessimistic about like, the, the business plan, basically. He was pessimistic we could like, actually uh, sustain ourselves. And I noticed myself getting defensive and finding reasons why he was wrong and not actually listening to him. And so, but because I like, knew this pattern, I stopped and just in a, in a moment asked myself, OK, you know, if he's right and this is a bad idea, I want to believe that he's right. Um, it would be bad for me if like, I you know, closed off my mind to this argument. Um, and so if you have a kind of trigger action plan set up, this is actually a thing in cognitive science uh, they call implementation intentions, where you're much more likely to establish habits if you have like, discrete triggers that you can recognize um, in the world. Uh, you know, that's something that can, I think, be more motivating for people and that maybe they haven't even thought about before. Um, and then lastly, I think that being in a social environment where changing your mind in response to evidence is, uh, is admired um, and refusing to change your mind is, you know, uh, like looked down upon a little bit, I think that can be very motivating for people. And so I don't know if, I don't know if this is something that, a, you know, a single semester class can do to sort of change the way people think um, about thinking, mm -hmm. but, you know, that's something we're certainly trying to hit at CIFAR to like spread this meme of admiring mind changing. And I think that I, I hope that will go a long way towards making people actually inclined to, to do these, you know, kinds of techniques. You know, it, it's interesting. You said two things that, that struck me. One of them was being in an environment where um, admitting that you're wrong is admired. And I think that just telling people it in intro psych classes even, making sure that people understand that that's everywhere, that in general people are more admired when they admit that they have done something wrong and changed their mind than when they're, sto when they're you know, stubborn about it um, is a big thing. And, but you said something about holding, holding that idea of there's, there might be a world where you're wrong. And that's something that actually Stanovich talks about. Um, it's part of that open-mindedness is, is, a, it is a, I think that is a skill. I think we may be able to teach that. And I certainly tried to in my class, classes. You need to be able to have, to set your own views aside and kind of hold them in a little escrow while you consider evidence, because you, otherwise you cannot be objective about the evidence coming in. So we need to have that ability to kind of compartmentalize and say, okay, this is what I believe, but I'm not going to consider that right now when I'm looking at this evidence. Then bring the filter back in and see how it all kind of shakes out. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a bit of a dialectic here that I'm picking up because on the one hand, I think what I hear you folks saying is that we need more role models. We need more examples of people, scientists, maybe politicians, maybe that's speaking too much, I don't know, uh, actually in changing their mind, admitting they were wrong about something, it's not very likely. But I think that's what I try to do in my teachings. I try to talk about all the dumb mistakes I've made over the years and I can go on forever about it. In fact, I often tell my students pretty openly that one of the things that drew me to skepticism, I think, is that when I was a teenager, I was into all this stupid stuff. You know, I was into ancient astronauts and ghosts and you. I mean, I was, a, you know, I was probably just as smart, probably smarter in terms of raw IQ back then than I am now. But I was a terrible critical thinker. I didn't have those skills. So I think being a good role model is important. On the other hand, from what Dan is saying, because of our very nature as scientists to push and push and push, 
and often be dogmatic and often you to a very strongly held idea, we're often not going to do that very well. We're often not going to be very good role models. So the question is how to, how, um, how to find good role models out there. I think it's, it's really, really difficult. You know, uh, a scientist named Brendan Nihan, or Nihan? Nihan, thank you, um, has uh, he's, he's focused on how to get people to be willing to change their mind in response to evidence. I mean, he, he just finished a like, three-year-long study of what will get people to change their mind about uh, you know, the vaccine autism connection. And it, it was actually it was pretty depressing. In the, in the article I read summarizing his results, he said, I'm so depressed like three times. Mm -hmm. um, nothing really works that well. Um, but, but so far in his study of this phenomenon, he's found one thing that does seem to help people um, sort of you know, adjust, uh, accommodate new evidence. Um, and that's, uh, he calls it a self-affirmation. It's basically like a, a little thing that you do to remind yourself of, you know, the things about yourself that you're proud of, the, the aspects of your identity that... I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and <laughs> doggone it, people, people like, like me. me. <laughs> I don't know if that was verbatim don't in do the that, study. No. Um, but but no, this sure. is basically, this is tied to mm. our our need to retain beliefs that are important to our identities, which is a surprising number of beliefs, like even something that seems very object level, like does this homeopathic medicine work or not, you know, getting rid of that belief could actually feel very threatening to your identity. Um, and so, what, like, when I look at what has made me, uh, to the extent that I'm good at changing my mind, I think the main factor is that I have this identity of being someone who changes her mind. And, and so I actually, like, get this little dopamine hit when I notice that I might be wrong about something, because I, I feel all you know, virtuous and proud of myself, like, <laughs> look at me, changing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're saying that, that everybody can win arguments with yeah. you, because that makes you yeah. feel good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one, yeah. of the, you know, one of the tricky issues here, which we haven't talked about maybe directly, is what, one of the dangers of some of these debiasing techniques, and I, I looked at some of this stuff a couple years ago, and, and speaking of being depressed, man, that mm -hmm. was depressing, because there's this literature on, on how to debias against, people against confirmation bias and hindsight bias, and middle East, it's probably more absence of evidence than evidence of absence. There's often just not a lot of psychological research on it, as you point out, but a lot of it's not very promising, and the one, one issue you have to be, one has to be careful about that I've come to recognize is that there's actually a increasingly large literature on backfire effects and one of the ones you're talking about I think is relevant to this is that when you challenge people's identity very strongly, sometimes actually their belief gets stronger. So you actually have exactly the reverse belief. So if you have someone who's deeply religious, for example, you start challenging their beliefs really, really hard, you threaten to pull the rug un from under them, you may actually strengthen their beliefs because it encourages them to find all kinds of reasons that their beliefs might actually be right. It kind of mobilizes their intellectual defenses, mobilizes their intellectual immune system. So that's, I think, one of the big challenges is how to debias people without actually inadvertently strengthening the beliefs. I don't know if that's something we want to talk about, but I think that's, I've been arguing for a couple of years that that's actually a really important direction for the skeptical community is how to do this right, how to do this properly. Because I think sometimes we just assume that when we debunk people's beliefs, everyone's going to be as rational as we are about these beliefs, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Talking about backfire effects reminded me of a, a, a chastening experience in my career. Many years ago, ABC television has a, maybe they still do, they had an annual retreat in Palm Desert where they took over a Hyatt hotel and had all of their top executives show up with their, with their uh, significant others for a big blowout party, but it was an uh, intellectual party. And I was invited, along with uh, uh, the Chicago neuroscientist Jerry Levy and uh, uh, Jonathan Miller, the uh, British polymath uh, television presenter, opera producer, and so forth. And uh, we were all asked to give talks. We show up treated like royalty. It was wonderful. Uh, we got there, and we found that we were the, we were the bad guys. And they also had some new age type people. Uh, the, uh, the man, Norman Cousins, who laughed himself out of cancer and some other um, uh, absolute randy fodder, you know. Uh, uh, and 
when we realized that our job was to do battle with these people, we got down to business and we just took them apart. And I was feeling pretty happy about the whole thing. There was a closing luncheon on Sunday and I was expressing my pleasure at what we had done to Jonathan Miller and he said, oh no, Dan, watch this. And he got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to ask you, before today, what percentage of you believed in ESP, clairvoyance, healing with laughter, da 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 da. And about a third of the hands went up. Now remember, these are, these are very smart people. They are ruthless climbers in the competitive world of network television. Um, about a third of the hands went up. And he said, and after this weekend, how many of you believe in it? Two thirds of the hands went up. I was, it was like being kicked in the stomach. Uh, I was so shocked by this, and I went around and asked some of those that had put up their hands, and they all said the same thing. They all said, well, I don't know, I just figure if you smart people work this hard to, to, to criticize it, there must be something to it. <laughs> so just w one quick follow-up. So there's uh, Norbert Schwartz is a really clever social psychologist at University of Michigan. He's done some work on some of these backfire effects. I'll give you one concrete example from the health literature. We talked about vaccines and so on. So you tell people, you give people a statement. You tell them the side effects of a flu vaccine are typically worse than the vaccine itself. And you say, okay, remember that? That's wrong. Okay. <laughs> That's not true. It's very rare, the side effect. Okay. And you tell people that. And then you test them a few minutes afterwards. They get it right. And so, okay, fine. And there's a control condition and so on. You come back a month or two later, you ask them again, and what you see is the false belief is actually strengthened. They now get it backwards. And what he argues is that there's like this little yellow sticky note in your brain that says, no, that's wrong. And that little yellow sticky note sometimes falls off over time. <laughs> and people remember, oh, yeah, I remember that thing I'm saying about the side effects of flu. But yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I discovered the same thing myself in my intro psych class. I, again, I haven't done any systematic research on this. I'm, I hope it works. I hope I'm not actually increasing false belief, but I do this little demonstration when I talk about memory. So I'm in the middle of like a memory uh, lecture and I have someone run in, I, you know, of course I, I plan, someone run in and steal something from me, like steal my umbrella or something like that. You know? And then, then the person leaves and then I ask them all kinds of questions, like did the person have a mustache? What color shirt was the person? And it's amazing how bad people are at that. And it really hits them up front how bad eyewitness memory can be. And they all remember that. And on several occasions, I can think of one case in particular, a few years after the course, a student coming up to me saying, oh yeah, I remember that, you know, they all remember the demonstration, it was very memorable, you know, the person burst in, oh, I remember that demonstration where you showed how accurate eyewitness testimony can be. You know, <laughs> I was like, oh no. And, um, and I think what this shows is that in the process of debunking, we certainly should debunk, I mean, all four, I do it too, but we also have to be sure to focus on the true beliefs as well. We have to keep our eyes on the ball and, and really present people with good science and, because if we keep repeating the false belief over and over and over again, people often use familiarity as a kind of heuristic to truth. I mean, that's, of course, um, commercial producers know that really well, right? That's why they keep repeating the same darn jingle over again. So you keep repeating it over and over again and people start saying, oh yeah, I've, I've heard this a million times, there must be something true to it. So that's something we have to keep in mind when we're debunking false beliefs. Yeah. I would also add that I feel concerned sometimes about the effect uh, of giving people examples of irrationality that are, to them at least, like very obviously irrational, um, which you know could include ESP and aliens and maybe homeopathy, etc. Um, I just worry that if if those are the examples they get of people having irrational beliefs, and it seems so obvious to them. Uh, that those beliefs are irrational, that, you know, I have, I have a friend who, who once described this phenomenon as the cowpox of doubt, by which he means <laughs> that, like, getting tons of examples of being wrong where it's so obvious to you that the person was wrong is almost inoculating you against thinking that you yourself could be wrong, mm -hmm. um, because my beliefs don't look anything like those beliefs. Um, oh, that's good. And... You know, which is not to say that we shouldn't, you know, talk about, uh, about, you know, that we shouldn't debunk things, of course, um, but that this is a danger. And this is kind of a catch-22 that I run into when I try to, you know, teach about biases, that on the one hand, you know, the, 
the bias has to be clearly a bias to people so that they like get what you're saying, but it also can't be a bias that they themselves have and that mm -hmm. you like can't prove to them in, on the spot that is wrong, or else they'll just think you're you know you're just wrong about what they're wrong about. Um, so there's like very little room in between those two, you know, Skill and, and Shribdis. Do you, do you ever have students argue with you about what the right answer to a problem is as if you made up the problem yourself? I mean, <laughs> you know, like classic stuff from the literature, I'd, I'd have students literally argue with me about what the correct answer just was. Just like mathematical yeah, it, yeah, stuff yeah. that's you know from the cognitive literature, but problems that that are meant problems. to show a, a way of thinking, and rather than accept because they don't because they don't see the problem with thinking that way, rather than accept that it is a problem, they yeah. will continue to try to literally argue with it. It's very difficult. What I try to do in that case is I do try to force people to face their own biases, but I try really hard to do it in a way that's not threatening. So. What I mean by not threatening is nobody else has to know that they had that belief or that they had that answer, they came to the wrong answer. They are the only ones that have to know. They have the, their own answer in front of them and they don't have to share it. So they don't have to admit to everybody else that, yeah. that they were human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yep. I've, I've recently, this is a slight change in, in topic. I've recently done a, an experiment of sorts testing out uh, a method for getting people to see each other's views that um, I'm happy to say we had pretty darn good results. Um, I call it the X on Y method. And here's how it works. You have a workshop, six, eight, 12 people with very strongly differing views on some scientific or philosophical issue. Everybody sends in a chapter. This is my initial contribution to this. Everybody's supposed to read those. Then I ask them, whose work would you like to introduce of those N? X on Y. And it goes around this circle. No two people talk about each other's work. So that you end up spending the first half an hour of the workshop on this topic introducing and explaining the views of one of the others. And it has a delicious effect on, on the attitudes and the, and the uh, open-mindedness of the group. I've just, I, did a, I did a week-long workshop in Santa Fe on cultural evolution, and I had Boyd Richardson and Hen Henrik uh, on one side, and I had Sperber, uh, Cladier, and Morin from France, and then I had uh, some some other uh, parties, but there was a there was a real failure of communication there at the outset, and that's gone, uh, it's just gone. It's really wonderful. And then we just did a, one more recently on philosophy of mind. Uh, those of you in the field who know uh, those of you who know anything about the field, imagine spending a week uh, together, uh, the Churchlands, uh, Andy Clark, uh, Jesse. Prince uh, David Chalmers and me, and we got on famously. <laughs> so uh, it is, I highly recommend this technique, and in a few days, there will be a summary of the first of these workshops on Dan Sperber's uh, Cognition and Culture website, uh, and you'll be able to see what happened. Well, I want to thank all of you and I, I, I know I'm supposed to be able to see the time but I can't see the time oh, <laughs> um, uh, but no I know it's almost over um, we've got 740 do, do, do we have time for questions George does anybody have anything that they just really need to say before we let the audience ask, ask questions? All right, while we're taking questions, um, I do a version of Dan's thing um, just myself. Uh, it's called the steel man technique, and it's the opposite of the straw man, where you like knock down a weak caricature of your opponent's argument. Instead, you like try to come up with the best articulation of their point of view, because actually people often give worse arguments than they, than they have reason to give, because people are just bad at explaining why they believe something. Um, and so you just like look for ways to strengthen their argument before you consider it or before you try to rebut it. Um, 
Like maybe there's a premise that, that you know, they hadn't stated, they were just sort of assuming, but if, if it is assumed, then they're right, you know? And you can think about whether that premise is right or you can like, you know, if they exaggerated, they said like all women do such and such, you could like ask, well, is it, you know, is it most or is it like more than men or whatever? You can find a, you know, more conservative claim than the one they made and see if that is actually something that you, you know, might agree with more than you thought you did. What's one of, um, is it Rappaport's rules, I yeah. think, of argumentation? I think you like. And, yeah. and I, I try to do that. Um, I wasn't familiar with those rules until I read your book, but I, I like that too. And I think it's a general principle of skepticism, which is always try to give the other side the best chance. Try to be charitable. So if they make some claim about UFOs, rather than take the low hanging fruit and debunk the easiest one, let's get the strongest evidence and see if that still withstands. Mm -hmm. Uh, scrutiny, and I think that's a, a basic. First of all, I think it's it's a good because it inculcates the principle of charity, but also I think it's a better method of argumentation. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a question? I'll come to you. Real, we have time for like one or two. One or two. Make sure your question's a question, not a story, a yarn, or a tale. It should have a point and be nice and concise, or else I'll throw you in question jail. <laughs> Uh, for Daniel Dennett, what's the, um, say in the last 10 years, what's the biggest thing, what's the biggest thing you've changed your mind on? The biggest thing I've changed my mind on? Um, I have a new view of the brain as a computer, which is, it's still, I fail, still think the computer uh, analogy is fine, but when you start thinking about the, uh, some of the differences between neurons and flip-flops, um, you realize that we don't have much of a handle on what the architecture of uh, such a computer would be. I'm, I'm working on it and thinking about it, and one of the things that comes up is that it's going to be deeply competitive uh, and relatively anarchic. There's no boss, there's no there's no routine, subroutine hierarchy. Um, and the most important fact is that almost all the computation that we do with our devices in our pockets and our laptops and everything else uh, relies on the fact that way down in the basement, the parts are all exactly alike. The flip flops, the registers, they are all exactly alike. No two neurons are alike. No two neurons are alike. And when you try to make an architecture, a computational architecture of neurons, that should loom large in your thinking, and it didn't used to. I used to think of the neuron as basically a McCulloch Pitts logical neuron, and I knew what we could do with those, but you can't do that with real neurons. We got one more quick one, I think, right here. I hope it's quick. Um, I'd like the speakers to address, if they would, the issue I haven't heard address, and that is personality types. For example, the Myers-Briggs classifications or the classic uh, inner-directed versus outer-directed person in, in terms of people who just really aren't open to rational thinking. They're more concerned with, for example, what other people think or how they feel. Could, could you address personality types? In 30 seconds. Uh, I'll go for it. I'll go for it. Um, yeah, the Myers-Briggs is not a great measure. It's, it's okay. I think that uh, there are some better measures out there. I think, and I think Julia was hinting at this earlier, there, there is a personality dimension called openness to experience or openness that's a little bit related to IQ. It's actually one of the few personality variables that's maybe it's correlated to like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 with, with IQ, though not very strongly. And that is a very potent disposition. It's probably the least well understood dimension of personality in my view, but I think it does relate to this broader disposition to be open to new ideas, to question one's beliefs. And more broadly, uh, Cy Epstein's done some work on this. There are broad individual differences in terms of, say, intuitive, experiential versus deliberate, rational thinking, which correspond a little bit to what Stanovich and West and Kahneman and later call kind of system one versus system two thinking. So some people are much more prone to just deliberating and, and, and I think it used to be called like need for cognition. Need There's for a closely cognition. related construct of that. Some people just really, 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 I mean, Carl Sagan, who I got to meet once before, was reminded me of that. I think he was sort of regarded as very intellectually ferocious and I saw a bit of that when I was with him. He was very nice to me, but he always wanted to know. He was always asking questions. He really, 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 really wanted to figure stuff out. And there, are, there is that very deep disposition that some people are very strong and other people are not. What I don't know is how much you can 
push that around, how malleable that is. I suspect there are probably limits to that. So you might have to give people almost like little intuition pumps or you know intellectual prostheses to kind of overcome some of those dispositions would be my hunch, but I'm not sure. I, I'm hoping that, that the RQ test can tease some of that out once it's developed and tested and Um, I would also say that there is a middle ground in between um, not wanting to change your mind at all um, because it's unpleasant and you know makes you anxious or whatever, and wanting to change your mind because you want to be charitable to other points of view and you like the idea of being the kind of person who changes your mind, et cetera. Um, there's a middle ground where you're sent, sort of taking advantage of some of your uh, personality traits that maybe aren't as like noble as wanting to you know be a mind changer or something. Um, that I've totally used to good effect before. Like, so if I'm in an argument and I don't want to change my mind because I'm feeling sort of in like battle mode, like competitive, um, and I don't want to lose the argument, I just remind myself that uh, this isn't exactly like a battle because in, in this you know, argument, uh, if I lose, I get a copy of the other person's weapon. <laughs> um, which, in other words, their winning argument, and then I can go around winning arguments with that weapon. <laughs> so I just rechannel my competitive instinct, um, and I think there's a number of things like that that you can do uh, to take pride or uh, fear or competitiveness and actually make it work for you in this regard. Like and with that, I think that's excellent. How about a round of applause for our great panel? Excellent. Yeah, that was fun. That's good.